talking about social perceptions, how we come to understand other people. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Cultures around the world are different because of the need to adapt differently to different environments. However, there are some norms that cultures universally maintain. The incest taboo is, is, is fairly universal. There is some form of friendship, respect of the friend's privacy, make eye contact while talking, don't divulge things said in confidence. People of higher status are talked to using formal talk, while those of lower status are spoken to familiarly. Language is a strong social identifier. Uh, I was just, I'm reading a book right now called um, Lady Chatterley... The First Lady Chatterley, it's uh, by D.H. Lawrence. It's really kind of interesting because it takes place in England. And um, the individual that um, that uh, the book is about is a, an upper class lady. And she falls in love with a, with a working class individual. And part of the difference between the two of them is the language that he uses uh, is is more dialectic than hers is. Hers is more standard English. And as it turns out, when he's mad at her, his dialect gets stronger and stronger and stronger when he's um, when he's happy with her, when he's making love to her, uh, he speaks in a, in a more um, uh, common English form. Uh, but when he's mad at her, he, his dialect gets stronger and stronger. Really kind of interesting um, because he uh, is suffering. One of the things ab about the book is that he's uh, suffering from uh, feeling that he's not good enough for her. And, and that's part of the, the, uh, the interplay of the book. Uh, it's really kind of fascinating. I'm, I'm only halfway through, so I'm not exactly sure how it turns out. But language is a strong social identifier. Higher status people are spoken to in a formal manner, and they will speak back to, to a subordinate in a more familiar manner, using their first names, for example. Um, she is uh, Lady Chatterley, uh, and he is a, um, a commoner, as it were. Uh, so when he is speaking to her in public, he has to refer to her, to her as Lady Chatterley. Um, strangely, when uh, he's not in public and they're just together, he calls her Chucky. So that's really kind of interesting. Uh, in most languages, there are two forms of the word you, uh, one that is formal and one used with the friends and intimates. And uh, this was pointed out in the book that... Uh, he calls her thou and thee when he's uh, when he's happy with her, and when he's uh, when he's not happy with her, he calls her you, which is kind of fascinating. In most circumstances, it is for the higher status person to suggest familiarity uh, with the lower status person, and of course, she is the higher status person, and uh, it's it's really kind of fascinating watching the the uh, interplay between these two individuals. I'm sure that you have heard of that 80% of com communication is nonverbal. This is why someone with autism spectrum disorder has a problem communicating. They must be taught to attend to people when they are trying to communicate in order to understand the person better. People lower on the autism, uh, autism spectrum, uh, what used to be called Asperger's syndrome, can learn uh, to attend to people easier, and for that reason, they have are are often seen like they have they seem like they have no problems. Nonverbal cues serve a variety of functions. They help us express our emotions. They help us to express our attitudes. They help us to express our personality. They cue us as to the emotions of others. They cue us as to the attitudes of others. They cue us as to the personality of others. The idea that humans communicate through facial expressions goes back to Charles Darwin's The Expressions of the Emotions in Man and Animals uh, that he wrote in 1872, that was published in 1872. Darwin's idea was that primary facial expressions are universal. All humans encode their emotions onto their faces in the form of expressions. All humans can therefore interpret or decode the expressions accurately. And if you look at this picture, can you tell who won? Which Jennifer won? 
<laughs> Darwin felt that facial expressions are so expressive because they were necessary ways of communicating before the strength of language. Early hominids uh, would make a bad face when they tasted something terrible, and that would warn all other hominids to stay away. Six major emotions. Uh, if you can identify these, this one is disgust. This one is happy. This one is surprise. This one is fear. Uh, this one is sadness, and this in, this is anger. Those are the six major emotions. Anger, sad, surprise, fear, happy, and disgust. Oh, universal facial expressions. Are these universal facial expressions? Uh, this one is contempt. This one is anxiety. This one is shame. This one is determination. This, whoops, this one is embarrassment. <laughs> and this one is envy. This one is pride. And this one is not impressed. Decoding facial expressions tend to be complicated when the individual is experiencing more than one emotion and uh, all are registered on the face. Uh, this is known as effect blending. A facial expression may be ambiguous and interpretation depends on context and cues. Culture may dictate how a facial expression is interpreted. Each culture will maintain their own display rules for facial expressions and nonverbal communication. U.S. cultural norms discourage emotional displays in men. In Japan, women are discouraged from showing strong emotion and, in fact, will cover their mouths if any emotion is evident. In the United States, the dominant culture admires direct eye contact and equates it with honesty. But in many native cultures and around the world, it is considered uh, rude. Uh, this is true in Nigeria, this is true in Puerto Rico, in Thailand, and in Japan. In Arab countries, their direct eye contact tends to be quite intense. As a matter of fact, by U.S. standards, it is considered piercing or rude. One aspect of nonverbal communication that does, doesn't register with most people is personal space. Some countries demand a great deal of personal space and others very little. The English maintain the most personal space. Um, the people that maintain the most personal space are North Americans, Northern Europeans, Asians, Pakistanis, and most Native American groups. Other countries have far less personal space when they converse. They want to be close enough to touch the other person. Uh, this is true in France, uh, this is true in Southern Europe, in the Middle East, and in South America. In the United States and much of the world, flashing two fingers is a symbol of peace, victory, or two. Uh, in the rest of the English-speaking world, if you make the gesture with your palm toward you, it means the same as the middle finger gesture. Thumbs up has only positive connotations in much of the world, but in the Middle East, Italy, and Greece, it means up yours and is undesirable. In the United States, making a circle with your index finger and thumb means A-OK, -okay, but in France, Venezuela, Turkey, and Brazil, it means zero or worthless. In Japan, it is a symbol for money. The summoning gesture in the United States means death in Singapore and Japan. In most of the world, left-handed people are tolerated for their backward uh, use of hands, and no one cares. In the Middle East, India, Sri Lanka, and Africa, the use of the left hand for anything isn't tolerated because it, because it is the hand you wipe yourself with. Hand gestures that are universally recognized in select cultures are referred to as emblems. Emblems are not universal, and this can sometimes lead to trouble. In 1992, President George H.W. Bush thought that he was flashing the peace sign, but because he was in Australia, it was equivalent to the finger. He was giving them the finger. <laughs> Whoops! 
In Norway in 2005, George W. Bush was meeting a crowd of well-wishers when someone in the audience yelled, Texas. The president immediately threw up the hook'em horn sign of the University of Texas Longhorns. Unfortunately, in Norway, the hand gesture is the sign of the devil. First impressions, or the primacy effect, can leave such a strong lasting impression that an individual will maintain the impression even in the face of overwhelming conflicting impressions. First impressions become perhaps the most important key in information integration. It doesn't take much to develop an idea about someone that is difficult to change. When someone makes a meaningful conclusion about another person's personality based on a brief encounter, it is called thin slicing. Even in the face of new and conflicting information that should prompt us to reconsider most people, um, or um, reconsider, most people will stick to their initial judgment. This is known as a belief perseverance. Research shows that belief perseverance won't allow jurors to ignore inadmissible evidence. Belief perseverance also explains why scientists have a hard time discounting fabricated published data. People find inconsistent thoughts uncomfortable and unpleasant. Thus, we go with our initial thoughts and because it takes less effort. We can use first impressions and nonverbal communication to our advantage by public speaking, make sure that the opening is strong, uh, job interviews, dress dress uh, well, uh, make eye contact, body posture, all affect evaluations, uh, handshake quality affects assessment of personality, and final hiring recommenda recommendations. Work done by Carvey, Cuddy, and Yap in 2010 showed that Merely by standing in a high power pose, an individual can raise their testosterone level and feel more confident. And these are high power poses. These are high power poses. These are low power poses. poses. More low power poses. You're closing yourself up. You're closing yourself up in all four of those. Here you're opening yourself up to people. Attribution theory is a theory that tr tries to explain others' behavior. Attribution tends to be attributed either to external causes or internal causes. For example, researchers have discovered that men are more likely to attribute a woman's friendliness to mild sexual interest. This is known as misattribution. This particular misattribution may be one of the main contributing factors to male behavior that women consider sexual harassment or rape. Males universally tend to be more sexually assertive than women. This may be one reason that 23% of women say that they have been forced into unwanted sex, while only 3% of men admit to forcing women into an unwanted sex act. Unfortunately, the more sexually aggressive a male, the more likely he is to misread women's communications. Fritz Heider was a Gestalt ther uh, psychologist who first proposed the attribution theory in 1958. Heider noted that when someone else does something, gets in front of you in traffic, it is because of internal reasons, revenge and evilness. When we do something that could be considered incorrect, we tend to attribute it to external causes. And that's a picture of me and my kids. I'm not exactly sure. That's, of course, that's a long time ago. That's 22 years ago. <laughs> I, my hair's brown. It's pretty white now. This is my daughter and this is my son. And I'm taller than both of them, as you can see. The reason is because I was standing up on a curb and they were down <laughs> in the gutter. <laughs> uh, and I certainly don't look like that anymore. My face isn't quite that narrow. When deciding about causes of behavior, we can make one or of two attributions. Internal dispositional attribution, and for a person is behaving in a certain way because of something about the person, for example, their attitude, their character, and their personality. External situational attribution, and for a person is behaving a certain way because of something about the situation. Assume most people would respond the same way in that situation. The covariation model is a theory that states that 
uh, to form an attribution about what caused the person's behavior, we systematically note that we note the pattern between the presence or the absence of possible causal factors and whether or not the behavior occurs. Kelly assumes that when we are in the process of forming an attribution, we gather information or data. The data we use, according to Kelly, are how a person's behavior co-varies or changes across time, place, different actors, and different targets of the behavior. By, the, by discovering covariation in people's behavior, you're able to reach a judgment about what caused their behavior. The covariation model focuses on observations of behavior across time, place, actors, and targets. It examines how the perceiver chooses either an internal or an external attribution. We make choices about internal versus external attributions by using three pieces of information. Consensus, the extent to which other people behave the same way toward the same stimulus as the actor does. Distinctiveness, the extent to which one particular actor behaves in the same way to different stimuli. And consistency, the extent to which the behavior between one actor and one stimulus is the same across time and circumstances. Internal attribution occurs when consensus equal is low, behavior is unique to the person, distinctiveness is low, person displays same behavior with different state targets and in different situations, and consistency is high, person's behavior occurs reliably across occasions. External attribution occurs when consensus is high, other people behave similarly in the same situation, Distinctiveness is high, the person's behavior is specific to that situation or target, and the consistency is high. The person's behavior occurs reliably across occasions. While information about all three dimensions may not be available, people will still make attributions. Most frequently, consistency and distinctiveness are used more than consensus. Humans are amazingly adaptive creatures. A small change in a social situation will affect drastically how a person feels and reacts to social circumstance. The difficulty for social so the, the social scientist is gauging which factor is the most important, the individual's internal criteria or the change in the social situation. Thus, people assume that what is pre pre presented as the legitimate and perpetual feelings of the actor this is called the fundamental attribution error. When Sylvia plays paintball, she becomes quite aggressive. Tobin had only seen her at the paintball field, so when he saw her at the grocery with her school friends, he greeted her very loudly and called her Mad Dog. The friends had never seen her playing paintball, so they teased the shy girl mercilessly. The male ego seems to use the fundamental attribution error often to maintain his ego. Peter Ditto uh, set up an experiment where men met a woman and then the woman rated the men on her impression of them. The men then guessed whether the woman liked them or not. When they were told that her negative criticism was part of the experiment, they discounted what she said. But when they were told that her positive comments were part of the experiment, they didn't believe it. They still thought she was attracted to them. Even when we know different, we, we assume that other people are the way that they act. When trying to explain our own behavior, we tend to attribute behavior to situations. I was angry because everything was going wrong. When explaining other people's behavior, their behavior is what they are. He is hostile because he is an angry person. This is also this is all fundamental attribution error. Voters come to, to like just elected of, uh, can, candidates. Uh, it's called the honeymoon period. Contestants value prizes more just after receiving them. People develop an instant liking for those they're about to meet. 
When Jermaine goes to parties, he's always amazed at how easily everyone melds with each other. He always feels shy and tense. Reality is, probably, that everyone feels pretty much the same as Jermaine. Researchers have known for decades that there is a difference between the perspective of being an actor in an event and an observer in that event. When we are the actor, the environment around us commands our attention. When we watch an event, we watch the actor in the event and the environment becomes less visible. Thus, the person we see as the focus is always the cause, the perceptual salient, and this is known as perceptual salience. Celeste was working undercover with the mess suppliers in Gala. Word got back to her that her cover was blown. As she walked past Smokey's Roadhouse on her way to, to her pickup, she heard a speeding car behind her. She turned and drew her pistol. She caught sight of a man sticking a rifle out the window and fired just as the car swerved into oncoming traffic. As Mary pulled out of Gas Max across the street from Smokey's, she saw a woman draw a gun wheel around toward traffic and fire indiscriminately at a car trying to get out of the way. The car plowed into oncoming traffic. When questioned on the witness stand, she did not see the rifle or perceive the car as speeding. Same situation, different perspective. One of the most persistent fundamental attribution errors around the world is the perception of poverty. People who attribute poverty and unemployment to personal dispositions, they're lazy and undeserving, tend to adopt political positions unsympathetic to such people. People sympathetic to their plight tend to attribute poverty to external attributions. Attribution is usually a two-step process. When something happens to us involving someone else, our first instinct is to detect an internal attribution. This may be an evolutionary reaction to protect us from a possible attacker. However, or I'm sorry, hopefully, we are open-minded enough to reevaluate our initial response and possibly adjust our initial reaction. Adjustment, however, requires effort and conscious attention. It doesn't always happen. We take personal credit for all of our successes. We blame our failures on someone else. Uh, yay, A+, plus. I, am, I am so smart. We take the uh, credit for positive events. F grade, she doesn't like me. Blame external factors for negative events. One domain in which self-serving biases may be particularly common is in the world of sports, especially among solo athletes for whom the entire weight of winning or losing rests on their shoulders. To maintain their own egos, they must find someone else to blame for their failures. One form of defensive attribution is to believe that bad things happen only to bad people, or at least only to, to people who have stu make stupid mistakes or poor choices. Therefore, bad things won't happen to us because we won't be that stupid or careless. Melvin Lerner called the belief in a just world, the, uh, this a belief in a just world, the assumption that people get what they deserve and deserve what they get. There are good things and bad things about just world beliefs. It helps people deal with feelings of vulnerability and mortality, uh, but unfortunately it often leads to blaming the victim. Rape victims and battered wives are good examples. When we think of our own attributional uh, biases and other people's biases, we feel or know that other people have more biases than we do, and this is known as bias blind spot. Western culture is holistic and uh, fosters holistic thinking about properties of objects, properties of people, individual autonomy, Judeo-Christian belief in an individual soul. They pay less attention to situation and context. Values in Eastern cultures foster analytic, analytic thinking. Eastern thinking focuses on the object or person and the surrounding context and relationships between them. Individualism versus collectivism, you must learn to think for yourself. 
That's individualism and collectivism. You must do what is best for the family. While members of individualistic cultures prefer dispositional attributions and think like personality psychologists, members of collectivistic cultures prefer situational ex explanations and think like social psychologists. Greater situational focus is a matter of degree. Self-serving bias, uh, more prevalent in Western individualistic cultures than Eastern collectivistic cultures. Explanations of Olympic gold success, reporters discuss success in terms of unique talent in the United States, but incorporated role of others, for example, coaches and family in Japan. Failure, uh, make attributions to external causes in the United States, but internal causes in China. Self-critical attributions hold groups together in some Chinese and same, some Asian cultures. Belief in a just world more prevalent in cultures with extreme differences in wealth. And that is the end of the chapter. So I'll talk to you guys next week.